Okay, yeah. Good afternoon, everyone, and good morning in Birmingham, UK, and good evening to all of you in different time zones. Welcome to the ninth edition of uh, the Combinatoric Today's series. We are very happy to see you again. We are very grateful to welcome the Dean of Faculty of Mathematics and Natural Sciences, ITB Professor Wayu Sri Gutomo for the constant support uh, to this event. And we also welcome to all colleagues and students for attending uh, this uh, program. Thank you so much for your participation in this program. And we really, really appreciate it. Our warm welcome to our to this uh, speaker for this event, Dr. Tom Kelly. He is a research fellow at the University of Birmingham, United Kingdom. And we are very, very lucky and grateful to have him as our speaker today. He currently proved the Erdos Faber Lavas conjecture for all sufficiently large values of N, together with uh, his colleagues, Dong Yap Kang, Daniel, da Daniela Kuhn, Abhishek Metuku, and Derek Ostase. As we know that this conjecture has been around about 50 years, I think. Yeah. And the proof is just fresh from the oven. And he will share today. Yeah. I think just last July, yeah, 2021, uh, uh, available the proof uh, in the archive. And the proof now, uh, yeah, you can see yeah, in this uh, program. So we are very, very lucky today. So, uh, hi, Tom. How are you today? I'm, I'm good. Good? <laughs> yes. Thank you for yeah. having me on. Um, Over there, it's a uh, very early morning, right? Yes. Probably. This, this, this time is the first time for you to have a seminar in early morning. Definitely the earliest time I've given a talk, <laughs> yes. Okay. So thank, so, thank you for being with us today. Yeah. Okay, and uh, I should also mention that uh, this uh, program attended by uh, many uh, mathematicians, in particular combinatories, yeah, from not only from Indonesia, but also from neighboring, neighboring countries. And some of them sometimes from Europe, yeah. So, and this program is uh, organized by uh, our research group, Combinatorial Mathematics Research Group, Faculty of Mathematics and Natural Sciences Institute Technology Bandung. And now we are all uh, very excited and honored to have Dr. Tom Kelly. And his talk will be chaired by Dr. Suhadi Widodo Saputro. But before we give uh, the control to Dr. Suhadi, I would like to ask uh, our chair of our combinatorics uh, research group, Dr. Joko Sukrianto, to give a welcoming speech. But Joko, time is yours. Yeah, thank you, Paidi. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome back to our combinatoric seminar, Combinatoric Today uh, series. Uh, first of all, uh, I will use this opportunity to uh, uh, to thank to our special uh, uh, guest lecturer, Professor Tom Kelly, for taking the time to attend to give this lecture. Um, uh, as we have known, uh, uh, among the expertise of Professor Kelly is something related with coloring of graph and. Uh, uh, it is just an information for you, Professor Kelly, especially uh, 
um, in our country, almost all of the combinatorialists are working on uh, graph theory. And so I believe that uh, we will uh, uh, obtain many uh, benefit of uh, your talk. And uh, yeah, moreover for uh, all the participants, we also uh, know uh, Professor Kelly for his uh, recent proof of, as Paddy uh, said before, of the conjecture of Erdos faber lovas And uh, again, uh, we are uh, uh, very sure that we can uh, uh, use this opportunity to, and we can take uh, 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 many advantage uh, of his talk. And I'm also very, su uh, very sure that uh, his talk will uh, broaden our knowledge in combinatorics. And uh, well, we do hope that we can use this opportunity also to hopefully, uh, have some uh, uh, collaboration in near future uh, with um, many mathematicians from abroad, especially for, with uh, Professor Kelly. So once again, Professor Kelly, thank you very much for your times and to the all the participants, uh, please enjoy the seminar. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, Pa Joko. And now uh, before I give uh, uh, the control to Pa Swadi, let us uh, have a photo session first, because I think this photo will be very important to mark our history of <laughs> having combinatoric to the series in Indonesia. Okay, Pa Suhadi, can you, uh, sorry, Pa Yusuf, yeah? Can you uh, help us to have a group photo? Okay, so for everyone who could open their camera, Please open it. There are only uh, 24 participants, so uh, it will only take one page. Okay, uh, wait a second. Okay, I will take the camera. Okay, please smile. One, two, three. Okay. Okay, thanks, everyone. Okay, thank you, Pa uh, Yusuf. And now I let Pa Suhadi to chair this session. Okay. So I will share uh, my slides first. Sorry. Uh, do you have seen my slides? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I will start. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and also good morning and good evening. Uh, respectable Professor Adi Tribaskoro, and also respectable the head of Combinatorial Research Group of ITB, uh, Dr. Joko Sopianto, the Honorable uh, Lecturers of the Mathematics Department of ITB, and also the Honorable uh, Members of Indonesian Combinatorial Society, and the Honorable All uh, Participants of Combinatorics Today Series. My name is Suhadi Widosa Putro, and I am the moderator of this Combinatorics Today seminar. I am very pleased to see you here and welcome of, uh, all participants to this seminar. The theme of uh, this ninth series is about uh, coloring hypergraphs of small codegree and a proof of the Erdos uh, faber lovas conjecture. And the talk will be given by Professor Tom, Tom Kelly. Uh, he is a great combinatorist and graph theorist from University of Birmingham uh, uh, in United Kingdom. Uh, he has received his bachelor degree. He received his bachelor degree from Princeton University in uh, 
2015, and uh, where he was also awarded the Middleton Miller 29 Prize for Best Independent Work in Mathematics. And he then obtained his PhD degree in combinatorics and optimization from the University of Waterloo in 2019, where he also was awarded the first place mathematics doctoral prize and was a university finalist for a, the Governor General's Gold Medal. Currently, he's a research fellow at University of Birmingham. He has also uh, published several papers and his papers have been published in a number of international journals, including the State Mathematics and Journal of Graph Theory. So now uh, let me allow you to welcome the speaker, Professor Tom Kelly, to deliver his presentations. The audience who want to ask a question can ask directly in discussion sessions after Professor Kelly gave his talk or you can uh, write your question on the, the chat box. So Professor Tom Kelly, the uh, time is yours. Let me share my screen. So first I'd like to say, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm, I'm really glad to be speaking here and thank you for organizing um, this great series. I'm really excited to be a part of it. Um, and so, Right, I'm going to be speaking about joint work today with, with Dongi King, Daniela Kuhn, Abhishek Muthuku, and Derek Osses. All of us are currently at the University of Birmingham. And I'll just start off by straight away saying the Erdos Faber Lovas conjecture. It's one of those problems that is um, quite simple to state and very beautiful, but also quite challenging. It states that if you have n complete graphs, each on the most n vertices with the property that every pair of them shares at most one vertex, then the chromatic number of the union of these graphs is at most n. So if you're not familiar with these terms, um, the chromatic number of, of a graph is the minimum number of colors that you need to properly color it. And by that, I mean minimum number of colors that you need um, to assign the colors to the vertices in such a way that adjacent vertices are assigned different colors. And so we can see this conjecture in action on this figure below. There are four complete graphs in this figure. They're highlighted by the green. Each one has the most four vertices. And you can see that every pair of them also shares the most one vertex. And so the conjecture predicts that we should be able to color the union of these graphs with the most four colors. And indeed, um, here is a, a proper coloring of the, the union of these graphs with the colors red, blue, orange and green. And so it's a very simple problem to state. Like I said, it was also a personal favorite of Paul Erdos. He often wrote that it was one of his three most favorite combinatorial problems. And he even offered $500 for a solution. So Paul Erdos would often offer a small cash prize for problems that he particularly liked. And there were only a, a few that he offered more than $500 for. Um, and so one of the main results that I want to tell you about today is that we can prove that this conjecture is true for a sufficiently large n. Now, today, I also want to tell you about a, a less well-known question of Erdos that actually is, is more general than the erdos over lovas conjecture. So this question asks, if you have n complete graphs, as in the erdos over lovas conjecture, that each have at most n vertices, and you also have the property that every pair of them shares at most t vertices, then what is the maximum possible value of the chromatic number of the union of these graphs? Okay, and so we can observe that the case t equals one corresponds to the erdos febrilovas conjecture, because in that case, we will have that every pair shares at most one vertex. And the erdos febrilovas conjecture will predict that the answer to this question for t equal to one is n. And so in a more recent paper, um, we can essentially answer this question for all t at least to and the most the square root of n when n is sufficiently large. 
And the answer turns out to essentially be t times n. So the, the theorem states that for t at least two and n sufficiently large, if we have these n complete graphs, as in the above question of Erdos, then the chromatic number of the union of these graphs is at most t times n. And so the reason that I'm saying this answers the question of Erdos is because this bound on the chromatic number is tight for infinitely many n. In particular, for infinitely many k and n, which I will tell you which values of k those are later, if n is equal to k squared plus one and, and t is at most k, then there is a construction of, of these graphs um, that have the property in Erdos's question, such that the union of them has t n vertices itself and is complete. And so in order to color a complete graph on, on t n vertices, we need at least t n colors. So this construction certifies that this, this bound is tight. And so for infinitely many n, the maximum possible value of the chromatic number of the union of these graphs in Erdos's question is equal to t times n. And as I said, this result holds for t less than square root of n. For t larger than square root of n, this range is already covered by a result of Horak and Chuser from 1990. They have a result that states that the chromatic number of the union of these gi will always be at most n to the three halves. And this result doesn't depend on t. Um, and so this, this result for t larger than square root of n is asymptotically best possible. So it's, it's, it's tight up to lower order terms because of this construction here when, when t is equal to k. Because n is equal to k squared plus k plus one, k is, is roughly the square root of n. And so this construction will give you um, a family of, of these graphs g1 up to gn, whether the union has um, kn vertices, which is essentially into the three halves. Now, I'd like to point out that this result, if you combine it with the result from the previous slide, will actually hold for t greater than or equal to one. But I, I, have, I have for t greater than or equal to two here to emphasize that this is a, a separate result from a more recent paper that also has a different proof. And over the course of the talk, I'll tell you about some of the differences in the proof for the different values of t. Okay, now I think these questions are very, Beautiful questions and interesting, but they're they're a bit deceptive. I think that a better way to think about these questions is in terms of hypergraph edge coloring. So I'd like to tell you about that next. So matching in a graph is just a set of disjoint edges. And a proper edge coloring of a graph is an assignment of colors to the edges so that no two edges of the same color share a vertex. Okay, so in this setting, rather than assigning colors to the vertices, we're assigning colors to the edges. And the connection here between matchings and edge colorings is that a, in a proper edge coloring, each color class is a matching. So a proper edge coloring corresponds to a decomposition of the edges into matchings. And th this, these notions hold for graphs as well as hypergraphs. So if you're not familiar with hypergraphs, a hypergraph formally is just a pair of vertices and edges like graphs, where the edges are subsets of the vertices. But for hypergraphs, the edges can be subsets of the vertices of any size, whereas graphs, edges all have size two. And so here's an example of a hypergraph on the right where every edge has size three. And there's a, I have the edges properly edge colored. And you can see that um, each color class is indeed a matching. So this, this set of two red edges is a matching, as this set of two blue edges, as is this set of green edges. Now, in general, we're interested in finding large matchings or finding edge colorings that use comparatively few colors. And so the chromatic index is a useful notion, which is the minimum number of colors that we need to properly edge color the graph or hypergraph. This is an analogous notion to the chromatic number, but the chromatic index um, is in the edge coloring setting. And it's noted by chi prime. So because the Peterson graph here is properly edge colored with at most four colors, the chromatic index is at most four. And it turns out that equality holds. The Peterson graph is somewhat famous for not having a proper edge coloring with three colors. Okay. Now for graphs, 
the study of matchings and the study of edge colorings is a very classical topic and it's very well understood. In particular for edge colorings, we have Vising's theorem, which essentially tells us that the chromatic index of any graph is always one of the most two values. It's either the maximum degree of the graph or it's the maximum degree plus one. So here the degree of a vertex in a graph or hypergraph is the number of edges that contain it. So for example, in the Peterson graph, every vertex is contained in three edges. And so every vertex has degree three. And just to color the edges instant to any single vertex properly, we need at least three colors. And more generally, we always will need at least um, delta colors if delta is the maximum degree to properly edge color a graph of maximum degree delta. And then Vising's theorem says that we will always only ever need a, at most one more color to properly edge color it. Now, the study of matchings and edge colorings, while classic for graphs, is much more complicated for hypergraphs. A simple way to illustrate this point is that the problem of three-dimensional matching, which is a special case of the complexity problem of determining the size of a maximum matching in a hypergraph, is one of Karp's original NP-complete problems. So for, for graphs, we have polynomial time algorithms that will find maximum matching, but for graphs, we don't expect that to be the case unless you believe P equals MP. And we also don't expect there to be a nice characterization of, of hypergraphs that have large matchings um, for the same reason. But in general, it's an interesting question from a research, research perspective, which hypergraphs have large matchings and which hypergraphs can we properly edge color with few colors? Now, before we move on, I wanna discuss some terminology for hypergraphs. First off, in this talk, hypergraphs will be allowed to have repeated edges. So for example, on the left here, this is a multigraph, and the red and the blue edge, you can see they have the same endpoint. So these are repeated edges. And that's not allowed in graphs, but in this talk, that will be allowed for hypergraphs. But I, I will not allow edges in hypergraphs to have size one. From the perspective of coloring, size one edges are a bit of a nuisance. And so unless I say otherwise, let's just assume there are no size one edges. Now the co-degree of a hypergraph is the maximum number of edges that contain any given pair of vertices. So for example, you can see in the figure on the left, in fact, every pair of vertices is contained in, in two edges. And so the co-degree of this hypergraph on the left is equal to two. Now hypergraph is linear if every pair of vertices is contained in at most one edge. In other words, a linear hypergraph has co-degree at most one. And the example on the right from the previous slide is a linear hypergraph. You can check that all of the vertices are contained in the most one edge. Now, finally, a k-uniform hypergraph is one in which every edge has size k. So in the figure on the left, every edge has size two, and so it's a two-uniform hypergraph. And on the right, every edge has size three, and so it's a three-uniform hypergraph. So with this terminology, the set of multigraphs is just the same as a set of two uniform hypergraphs. And graphs are just a set of two uniform linear hypergraphs. Now it's natural to ask whether Vising's theorem also holds for hypergraphs. But Vising's theorem doesn't even hold for multigraphs. This figure on the left gives such an example. This multigraph has maximum degree four, but it requires at least six colors to properly edge color. Nevertheless, for linear hypergraphs, we can perhaps have some analogs in Vising's theorem in the hypergraph setting. One such example is the pippiger spencer theorem. This is a very famous theorem for edge coloring hypergraphs that has many applications. It says that if you have a hypergraph that has bounded edge sizes and max degree at most delta, if the co degree is little o of delta, then the chromatic index of this hypergraph is the most delta plus little o of delta. And so in particular, linear hypergraphs have code degree little o of delta. And so this theorem says that um, you can think of it like a approximate or asymptotic version of Vising's theorem for 
hypergraphs with bounded edge sizes and small code degree. Now, an important corollary of this result is what's known as Pippinger's theorem, which says that k-uniform hypergraphs that are delta regular, which means that every vertex has a new delta, have nearly perfect matchings if they have small code degree. And another um, important corollary of this result in turn is the result of Roto from 1985 that approximate combinatorial designs exist. And I won't go into details on what that means, but this is a very influential result in combinatorics. It has led to what's known as the Nibble method, which is an important tool in the probabilistic method. And it's one that we use in the proof of the Erdos Trevor conjecture and has numerous other applications. In fact, with, with my co-authors, we've written a survey on the Nibble method in graph and hypergraph coloring. So I'd like to tell you a bit about how this, this method works. Let's consider the special case of Pippinger's theorem when k equals three. So for three uniform hypergraphs. So we want to construct a nearly perfect matching. And we want to do so probabilistically. The idea is to consider a small random selection of the edges. In fact, every edge will be chosen independently with some small probability. And now there, there is a chance that some of the edges in this selection, like here, will overlap. So for example, these two vertices, they share a vertex. And so the selected edges aren't necessarily a matching. So what we'll do is eliminate any of the edges from the selection that overlap. And we'll keep what remains. And so what remains will be a small matching. And we repeat this process. We select edges again randomly and we discard the ones that overlap. And in doing so, we kind of nibble away at the graph and we continue this process for as long as we can. And, it, and the magic of this, this method, which was Rodel's main insight, is that this, this random procedure with high probability will produce a nearly perfect matching. And this, this process also works for coloring graphs efficiently. In particular, it yields the pivoter spencer theorem as well. Okay, so now let me talk about the Erdos Trevor-Lewis conjecture. If you think of the Pippinger Spencer theorem as an asymptotic version of Vising's theorem for linear hypergraphs that have bounded edge sizes, the Erdos Trevor-Lewis conjecture is like a version of Vising's theorem for linear hypergraphs where the edges are allowed to have any size. The conjecture in the edge coloring setting states that every n vertex linear hypergraph has chromatic index at most n. And I'd like to explain why this edge coloring formulation is equivalent to the vertex formulation that I gave you on the very first slide, which I've repeated below. To see this equivalence, we need two notions. The first notion is the notion of a line graph. Consider this hypergraph on the left. Its line graph is pictured in the middle. The vertices of the line graph are the edges of the original hypergraph. And you can see the correspondence with the colors here. For example, this blue edge on top corresponds to this blue vertex, and this bottom blue edge corresponds to this bottom blue vertex. And vertices in the line graph are adjacent if the corresponding edges share a vertex. And so what that means is that for every vertex of the original hypergraph, we add a complete graph into the line graph. So for example, this bottom left vertex corresponds to this complete graph on these four vertices. You can see the, the four colors of the edges containing this vertex are red, green, orange, and blue. And the colors of these vertices are red, green, orange, and blue. So in particular, if, if we start with an in-vertex linear hypergraph and we consider its line graph, it will be of the form the union of n complete graphs each on the most invertices. And because what we started with is linear, we will additionally have this property that every pair shares the most one vertex. And so we can apply this formulation to the line graph and transfer that back to the original. And a proper vertex of coloring of the line graph will yield a proper edge coloring of the original. And so we have that the bottom formulation implies the top formulation. Now to see the opposite implication, we need the notion of hypergraph duality. So suppose that we have n complete graphs as in the bottom formulation. 
we can construct some kind of auxiliary hypergraph, like the figure on the right, where for each one of these complete graphs, we include a hyper edge consisting of the vertices of that complete graph. And then when we take the hypergraph dual, the vertices of this hypergraph go to edges and edges go to vertices. And then if we take the line graph, we get back to what we started. So there's, kind, there's this kind of cycle here. And so by considering this auxiliary hypergraph and taking the dual, what we get will be a linear hypergraph on n vertices. And so if we can properly edge color that with the most n colors, then we can transfer that to the vertex coloring setting to get a proper vertex coloring with the most n colors. So I'm sweeping a, a small number of details under the rug here, but in general, that's how these two formulations are equivalent. Now let's consider what happens when we apply the same reasoning to this more general question of Erdos. So again, the formulation is on the bottom that I gave you before, the vertex coloring formulation. So let's suppose we have n complete graphs as in this formulation, and we consider the same process. We construct this auxiliary hypergraph where the complete graphs go to auxiliary hyper edges, and we take the dual. It will turn out that we obtain from this process a hypergraph where the max degree is equal to the maximum size of one of these cliques. So for example, this hypergraph on the left has maximum degree four. You can see this top vertex is contained in the red, blue, purple, and orange edge. And this will correspond to this complete graph on four vertices. And the co-degree of this hypergraph will be equal to the maximum of the intersection of any two of these cliques. And so for example, the co-degree here on the left is, is two as witnessed by the red and the blue edge. And this pair of red and blue edges corresponds to these red and blue vertices, which are contained in the intersection of, for example, this top cleek and this bottom left cleek. And so for this reason, the formulation of this question of Erdos that I gave you before is equivalent to the one at the top that says that if you have an in-vertex hypergraph that has maximum degree at most n and co-degree at most t, then the question asks, what is the maximum possible value of this chromatic index? Now, as before, the case t equals one of this question corresponds to the erdos faber wilbos conjecture. Because the case for t equals one, co-degree at most one means that the hypergraph is linear. For this question, though, we have this additional condition that the maximum degree is the most n that didn't appear in the erdos faber wilbos conjecture. But for the case t equals one, this condition is somewhat redundant because linear hypergraphs on n vertices have maximum degree of most n. But for larger values of t, this condition is important. Already, for example, this figure on the left has co degree two and three vertices, but has maximum degree four. Okay, so I claim that this edge coloring formulation is in some ways a better way to think about the erdos faber wilbos conjecture. And one of the main reasons why is because it's, it's easier to understand what the extremal examples are. And it's crucial to understanding the structure of the extremal examples if you want to prove this conjecture. There are essentially three main families of extremal examples. One such example are the finite projective planes. So on the left, I have pictured the Fano plane which is the finite projective plane of order two. More generally, the finite projective plane of order K is a K plus one uniform hypergraph that is both intersecting and linear. And the number of vertices of the hypergraph will be K squared plus K plus one. And this will also be the number of edges. So for example, in the Fano plane it has seven vertices and it has seven edges. And it's extremal because it's intersecting, which means that every pair of edges intersects in a vertex. So in order to color an intersecting, in order to properly edge color an intersecting hypergraph, you need to assign every edge a distinct color. And so in order to properly edge color the Fano plane, since it has seven edges, immediately seven colors, and more generally, in order to properly edge color a projective plane of order K, we need at least N colors. So it certifies that the conjecture is best possible. Now, the second 
extremal example is extremal in some sense for the same reasons. It's an intersecting and linear hypergraph where the number of edges is the same as the number of vertices. But the construction is much more trivial. The construction is just to take one very large edge of size n minus one, which will leave out a special vertex, and then to add all of the size two edges from that vertex to every other vertex. And it's fairly easy to see that this turns out to be intersecting and linear. And this is what's known as the degenerate, degenerate plane or linear pencil. So both of these constructions are coming from geometry, where you can think of them as point line configurations, where the vertices of the hypergraph correspond to points and the edges of the hypergraph correspond to lines. And this property of the hypergraph being linear is that every pair of points is contained in a unique, a unique line, which is a ge geometric axiom. And this intersecting property is that every pair of lines intersects in a, in a unique point. Now, finally, the third extreme example is simply the complete graph on an odd number of vertices. So if you want to properly edge color a complete graph on n vertices with less than n colors, then because every vertex has degree n minus 1, all of the colors will appear on the edges containing every vertex, which will imply that every color class is a perfect matching. But only vertices on an even, sorry, only graphs on an even number of vertices have a perfect matching. So for n odd, the complete graph on n vertices gives us another extreme example. Now I I claim that the answer to this question of Erdos, the more general question, is t times n. So I'd like to pose the following conjecture as a stand-in for the question of Erdos, because Erdos didn't actually um, conjecture any particular value for what the maximum possible chromatic number or chromatic index is. So the, the conjecture is what I'm referring to as the, the TEFL conjecture, which states that every n vertex hypergraph with co-degree at most t and maximum degree at most n has chromatic index at most t times n. And if true, this is, this is best possible as certified by what we call the t-fold projective planes. So the t-fold projective plane is just obtained from a projective plane by replacing each edge with t repeated edges. So for example, the order one projective plane is actually just a triangle. And so this figure on the left is the threefold order one projective plane. This figure on the right is just the phantom plane. So that's just the one-fold phantom plane. If we repeated every edge, then it would be the two-fold phantom plane. And so I claim that these are extremal examples for the TEFL conjecture if T is at most K, where K is the order of the projective plane. So first off, why do they require T and colors to properly edge color them? Well, for the same reason that the projective plane is intersecting, the t-fold projective plane is also intersecting. And it will have t times n edges, OK? So in order to properly edge color an intersecting hypergraph with t times n edges, we need t times n colors. And you can check that the co-degree of these hypergraphs is equal to t, which is required in the question. And the max degree is also t times k plus 1. And this is because the maximum degree of the projective plane of order k is just k plus 1. And so when we take the t-fold projective plane, we need to multiply that by t. And this will be at most n when, when t is at most k. OK, so I said I would explain what values of k um, yielded this construction from before that certified that the answer to the Erdos question is t times n. And here it's these, it's the, it will be the line graphs of these uh, t-fold projective planes. And so the, the, the projective planes are known to exist when k is a prime power. And that's actually a major conjecture that this is the only time when projective planes of order k exist. But for at least infinitely many k, we know that projective planes of order k exist. And they provide extreme examples for this conjecture. Okay, so now I'll tell you about some 
some previous results for these questions. So here's the Erdős table. Well, let's conjecture again. And it's interesting to observe that if you simply color the edges of your hypergraph greedily, starting with the largest edges first and ending with the smallest edges, this procedure will use at most two n colors, which says which gives you a bound on the chromatic index of in vertex linear hypergraphs, which is a factor in most two away from the conjecture already. And in 1989, Chang and Waller improved this argument to provide a bound that's three and over two. A different approach to the conjecture is to prove some relaxations of it. The theorem that predates the, the conjecture is actually the De Bruyne Erdős theorem from 1948, which implies that the conjecture is true for intersecting hypergraphs. So of course, in order for the Erdős paper loss conjecture to be true, we need the intersecting linear hypergraphs on vertices contain at most n edges. And this follows from the De Bruyne Erdős theorem. Seymour strengthened this result in 1982 by showing that every in-vertex linear hypergraph contains a matching of size at least the number of edges of the hypergraph divided by n. And the reason that this is a relaxation of the erdos lobos conjecture is because if you have a proper edge coloring of a hypergraph with n colors, then that will give you a decomposition of its edges into matchings. And the average size of those matchings will be at least this. And so in particular, the largest one of them will also have size at least this. Finally, Kahn and Seymour, a decade later, proved a fractional version of the Erdős Fable Loss conjecture. Now, I think the most important previous results for this conjecture come from a probabilistic approach. In particular, they use the Nibble method that I described to you earlier. And already, actually, the pippinger spencer theorem has some very important consequences for the Erdős Fable Loss conjecture for hypergraphs that have bounded edges. So in particular, if every edge of your hypergraph has size at least three and has size at most k, then the maximum degree, since it's linear, will be at most n over two. And thus for large enough n with respect to k, the pippinger spencer theorem will, imp will imply that the chromatic index is at most n, which certifies that the EFL conjecture is true in this regime. For similar reasons, the Pippin or Spencer implies an asymptotic version of the EFL conjecture. That is, it implies that the chromatic index of an in-vertex linear hypergraph is the most n plus little o of n. For hypergraphs where the edges have size at most k for any constant k, assuming n is sufficiently large. And finally, for this more general T EFL conjecture, when T is at least two, the Pippin or Spencer theorem actually implies the conjecture for hypergraphs with bounded edge sizes and large enough n. Because in the TEFL conjecture, recall that we, we impose that the hypergraph has maximum degree of most n. Okay. Now using these results, actually using a list coloring generalization of the Pippin or Spencer theorem that, that Kahn proved, Faber and Harris and Kahn were able to extend these results for hypergraphs that have edges that are unbounded size. In particular, if all the edges have size at least three and have size at most some absolute constant times squared in, the result of Faber and Harris implies that the erdos fibro lowest conjecture is true. So note that this range of edge sizes excludes the three extremal examples that I showed you. The complete graphs have all edges of size two, which is not in this range. And the projective plane has edges of size squared in, and the degenerate plane has an edge of size n minus one, which are too large for this range. Now, Kahn was able to show in 1992 that every n vertex linear hypergraph has chromatic index at most n plus a little over. So this is an asymptotic version of the conjecture. Both of these results here proceed by first coloring the edges that are that are large in a, in a clever way. And then using this less coloring generalization of the Pippin Spencer theorem to extend that coloring of the large edges to a coloring of the small edges in a way that's compatible with the coloring of the large edges. Okay, so finally, one of the main results of ours, again, 
is that we can confirm the EFL conjecture for all but finite many hypergraphs. And in the edge coloring setting, this means that for sufficiently large n, every in-vertex linear hypergraph has chromatic index in most n. We also prove a stability result that it contradicted. We proved that for every F, for every delta, there exists some sigma, so that for insufficiently large, if you have an in-vertex linear hypergraph with the following two properties, one, it has maximum degree bounded away from n, and two, the number of edges of size roughly squared in is also bounded away from n, then we can bound the chromatic index away from n, but by sigma. The reason that this is a stability result is because these two conditions together, um, they say that this hypergraph H is not too close to one of the extreme examples. So in particular, the projective plane on N vertices has N edges that all have size essentially squared in. So the second condition is, is saying that H is not too close to the projective plane. Now in our more recent paper, we have the following result that confirms this TEFL conjecture and answers the question of Erdos for T greater than or equal to two and for all but finitely many hypergraphs. And we actually strengthen that result in three ways. The theorem states that for all epsilon at least zero and insufficiently large, if you have an in-vertex hypergraph with co-degree at most T and now maximum degree at most one minus epsilon T times N, then the list chromatic index is at most Tn. So one of the ways that this strengthens the question of the answer to the question of Erdos is that we have a relaxed maximum degree assumption. In the TEFL conjecture, we have maximum degree at most N, but in this theorem, we're allowing ourselves to have maximum degree of up to one minus epsilon T times N, which is much more relaxed for T greater than equal to two. And moreover, we, we proved that this result holds for list coloring. So if you don't know what list coloring is, don't worry, this, this also holds if this is the just ordinary chromatic index. And finally, the third way in which we strengthen the answer to Erdos's question is that we characterize the extremal examples for this theorem. So in particular, if equality holds in this bound, then we can show that the hypergraph is in fact the t-fold projective plane. That's the only extremal example. Now, it's also interesting to note that this theorem holds when t is equal to one as well. But when t equals one, it does not imply the erdos faber rolovas conjecture because we have a more strict assumption on the maximum degree in this case. So when t equals one, we have that the maximum degree is at most n minus epsilon n. Nevertheless, I think this is an interesting result in this case because it, it says that if the maximum degree is not too close to n in the erdos faber rolovas conjecture, then, well, the conjecture holds in this case. And moreover, it holds for list coloring and the only extremal example with this maximum degree assumption is the projective plane. So in, this, in the second paper, we also generalize the stability result from the previous slide, and we generalize the De Bruyne Erdos theorem. So this here is the De Bruyne Erdos theorem generalization. We prove that if you have an in-vertex hypergraph that's intersecting, that has co-degree at most t, then the number of edges of the hypergraph is at most t times n. And moreover, if equality holds, then this hypergraph is either a t-fold projective plane or a t-fold near pencil. So the case t equal one of this theorem is just the De Bruyne Erdos theorem. So I think it's a very nice and natural generalization. Our main motivation for proving this theorem is to characterize the extremal examples in the theorem above. So in particular, we prove that if equality holds in this bound, the hypergraph h is intersecting. And then we deduce from, from that and this De Bruyne Erdos theorem generalization that the hypergraph has to be the t-fold projective plane. It cannot be the t-fold near pencil because the t-fold near pencil has maximum degree t times n, or t times n minus one. Okay, so now let me tell you about a bit about the proof. Could I ask how much time I have left at this point? Uh, you still have 20 minutes. Okay. Sorry, the time just isn't appearing for me on the computer. So that's great. That's perfect. So combining the results from 
the two papers, we get the following theorem. That if you have an in-vertex hypergraph of maximum degree at most n and co-degree at most t, then the chromatic index is at most t times n for n sufficiently large. And so I'd like to give you a high-level overview of the proof and give you some of the important stepping stones um, that lead to the proof. The first important stepping stone is what I call the small edge case. It's to prove this theorem for hypergraphs where all of the edges have size at most k for some constant k. And Kahn in, in 1994 actually asked this for k equals three. So in, indeed, Kahn was right that this is an important stepping stone towards the conjecture, and we, and we were able to, to prove it, of course. In this case, as I mentioned earlier, the Pippinger Spencer theorem applies. In particular, this probabilistic approach with the Nibble method um, is, quite, is quite important. For t greater than or equal to two, already the Pippinger Spencer theorem actually implies this result in the small edge case. And for t equal to one, it gives you an asymptotic version of the result. It gives you that you can find a proper edge coloring with the most n plus little of n colors. So the main task in this case is when t equals one, we need to figure out a way to get rid of this extra little of n colors. And for this, we use some ideas from what's called absorption to reduce it to a problem about coloring graphs. And I'll tell you a bit about that more later. Now, having achieved this stepping stone, the next important case is what I call the FPP extremal case. And this is the case when all of the edges have size at least one minus delta squared in for some small constant delta. And this case is important because it contains the case when H is the t-fold projective plane. Because the projective plane has n edges that all have size essentially squared in. And so this, this is a bit of a delicate argument that lasts a couple of pages that I won't go into the details on today. Now for, for t greater than equal to two, we, we build on the ideas from the t equals one case, but there are some additional challenges. Um, but the, we are able to generalize the argument. And moreover, in this second paper of ours, another one of our contributions is to prove that one, this, in this case, we can prove that it works, the argument works for list coloring. And two, that we can actually kind of, in some sense, save one of the colors, unless the hypergraph is intersecting. Now, the third case is, contains this, the second case as a special case. It's the case when all of the edges are large. So if all the edges have size at least R for some absolute constant R, you can think of R as like a million. In this case, this greedy coloring argument where you order the edges by the size works particularly well. If all of the edges have size at least R, it turns out that this greedy coloring will actually use at most one plus two over R times T in colors. And so already in this large edge case, we have some asymptotic version of the, of the conjecture. And our strategy in this case is to try to reorder the edges. So we start with this ordering by the size and we, we change the ordering a little bit. And we wanna do so in such a way that the greedy coloring will only need at most n colors. And so if th this reordering argument succeeds, then we are happy because we can find the proper edge coloring that we want just by a greedy argument. And what we prove is that if it doesn't work, then we find some highly structured subhypergraph W that is essentially all of the hypergraph in the sense that most of the edges of H are in W that is highly structured. In particular, it's either the default projected plane, in which case we can use arguments from the FPP extremal case, or its line graph is locally sparse, in which case we can color it probabilistically. And I'll, I'll say a bit more about that later. Finally, having achieved these three stepping stones, we can prove the theorem by merging the cases and applying the arguments from each case. And our strategy to find this proper edge coloring is to split the edges into the large edges and the small edges. And we will color the large edges first. And so obviously to color the large edges, we'll use arguments from the large edge case. But then we need to do some additional work in order to set ourselves up later to be successful when we want to color the small edges. And then we, we move to color the small edges. And we, of course, use arguments from the small edge case. But we need to do, again, some additional work to avoid conflicts with the 
coloring of the large edges. Now, if, you, if you're really interested in understanding the proof of the air disturbed Willis conjecture, the proof is a bit easier to, to digest. If you look at these, if you look at the proof of these um, special cases kind of separately. In the, in the proof in our paper, we need to, we have these additional arguments that allow us to merge the two cases. But I mentioned that, that we've written this survey on the nibble method in graph and hypergraph coloring. And in that survey, we've, we've also written down the arguments in these special cases independently of each other. And so if you want to understand the proof, I would highly recommend having a look at that survey where you can see the arguments written out separately. Um, and then once you understand that, then it will be a lot easier to understand the whole proof um, where we have to merge these cases. Okay, so now I'd like to talk about a few of these points. Of course, I can't talk about all of them, but let's start with the small edge case when t equals one. So let's say we have a linear hypergraph and let's say all of the edges have size either two or three. And so we wanna find a proper edge coloring with the most n colors. Now in this case, if we have two vertices that um, aren't contained in an edge, what we can do is just add the graph edge. So for example, if these two vertices aren't adjacent, we can just add that extra edge and we only make the problem more challenging for us. And in doing so, we can assume that every pair of vertices is contained in an edge. And as a result, every vertex in this hypergraph H will have degree between n over two and n. And this dichotomy is important. So on, on one end of the spectrum, we have vertices that are contained exclusively in size three edges. And those vertices will have degree n over two. And in some sense, these, these vertices are challenging to deal with because these vertices are contained in size three edges and size three edges are more difficult to deal with than, than graph edges. In general, it's just easier to work with graphs than it is to work with hypergraphs. But it, on the other hand, for these vertices, we have quite a bit of flexibility because to color this part locally, we only need half the colors. They have degree n over two and we have n colors to work with. On the other end of the spectrum, we have vertices that have high degree. Here, a vertex could have degree up to n minus one, in which case to color the edges containing that vertex, we need to use nearly all of our colors. And so that, that's, so that vertex is, is difficult to color. But in, on the other hand, the, a vertex like that is contained mostly in, in size two edges. And so the presence of these vertices means that there are a lot of graph edges in our hypergraph. Okay, so our strategy will be to fix constants gamma and epsilon that are quite small and define U to be the set of vertices that have high degree, the vertices that have degree at least one minus epsilon times N. And in particular, these vertices will be contained in a lot of graph edges, a lot of size two edges. And we'd like to reduce the problem to Vizink's theorem. Our, so our strategy for doing that is to use a bit more than half of the colors, to use N over two plus gamma N colors, and partially color the hypergraph in such a way that all of the size three edges are colored. And that for each vertex, roughly half of the graph edges containing it are colored. So you can see in the figure below, suppose N is nine, Using four colors, all of these um, size three edges are colored. And here, ha half of the graph edges containing this vertex are colored. Um, but then we need this additional property that every color class covers the set U. So we need to treat this set of high degree vertices with special care. And we call this property the perfect coverage property. So having done this, we can finish the, the coloring by simply using physics theorem. So in particular, if we look at the uncolored hyper edges, then vertices in U will have remaining degree less than N minus K because the degree initially was at most N minus one and we colored K of the edges containing it because of this perfect coverage property. And vertices not in U initially had left, 
initially had degree at most one minus epsilon n by definition of u. And we colored roughly half of those edges. And so only a bit more than half of them remain. And because of the choice of gamma and epsilon, this is also less than n minus k. So because we all of these size three edges have been colored, the uncolored edges are all graph edges. And that means we can apply Vising's theorem. And this argument says that the maximum degree of this graph is less than n minus k. And so we can use at most n minus k colors to finish it. And so combining these two colorings, one with k colors and one with n minus k colors, we will have colored all of the edges in such a way that we've used at most n colors. Now this argument, unfortunately, doesn't always work. In particular, for one of the extremal examples, the complete graph on an odd number of vertices, it's not possible to find such a coloring that has perfect coverage. In the case when the graph is complete, the set U of high degree vertices will, essentially, will, will be the set of all the vertices. And when N is odd, a coloring with perfect coverage would be one in which every color class is a perfect matching, which doesn't exist. So what we can do instead is find a coloring with, with nearly perfect coverage, which is kind of a, the next best thing. We'll have that every color class covers all but one vertex of U, which resolves this parity problem. And we'll do so in such a way that each vertex of U is covered by all but one color class. And the same argument that I gave you, reducing this problem to Vising's theorem, will work if we have nearly perfect coverage instead of perfect coverage, coverage, if we allow ourselves to use one extra color. So if we're satisfied with the ground, chi prime is the most n plus one, then actually there's a fairly short proof in this case. And actually in the survey that I mentioned before, we write down this argument, this simplified argument that uses one extra color. And it's, it's only about five pages. I think it's really nice. And it uses ideas from absorption. In particular, the absorption ideas are used to obtain this perfect coverage property. So if we only wanted these first two properties in this Vising reduction, this, um, the nibble method would work well. A random coloring of the hypergraph using the nibble method would give us these first two properties. And then we need to use absorption um, to get this perfect coverage property. And then to get rid of this one extra color and to prove the bound that the chromatic index is always the most n, we need some additional ideas that I won't go into the detail on. That's all I want to say about the small edge case. And now let me move on to saying a bit about the large edge case. And let's again assume that t equals one. So we're dealing with a linear hypergraph now where all of the edges have size at least r for some absolute constant r. And it's fairly trivial to observe that in any linear hypergraph, if you look at any edge E, like this edge at the bottom here, the number of edges that intersect E that have size at least E is at most this quantity. It's at most E times n minus E divided by the size of E minus one. So the numerator here is the number of pairs of vertices, where one of the vertices is any, and one of the vertices is not any. And because our hypergraph is, is linear, the number of edges of size at least e that intersect e um, has to be at most this, because each one of the each one of those edges that intersects e will kind of use up um, the size of e minus one of these pairs, these pairs of vertices in e and a vertex not in e. So the important consequence of this, um, this fact is that if you order the edges, as I said, starting with the large edges first and ending with the small edges, which is what I'm calling size monotone decreasing, then this, this forward degree of, of every edge will be at most n plus two n over r. So if you imagine the line graph, if you imagine ordering the vertices of the line graph according to the size monotone decreasing ordering, and you look at how many neighbors does each vertex of the line graph have that come before it. This will be this number, the number of edges of size at, at least e that intersect e. And this argument shows that the forward degree of this ordering of the line graph is not is only a bit larger than n. So in particular, if I color now the vertices of the line graph from left to right, if I do it greedily, I will only ever use at most n plus little of n colors. So our reordering argument is that we're going to try to 
reorder the edges or the vertices of the line graph in such a way that this forward degree is at most n. And the reordering idea is, is a fairly simple uh, strategy. Consider, consider the last edge that has forward degree greater than or equal to n. If we can find some neighbor in the line graph that has at most n edges preceding e, they intersect it, then we will just move f to after e. And because these two properties will ensure that when we move f to after e, the forward degree of f will also be less than n. And so f, so we'll be happy with that. So we have these vertices at the end of the ordering that are good in some sense, their forward degree is less than n. And this simple idea of reshuffling, if it works, will increase the number of good vertices at the end of the ordering. And we want to repeat this process for as long as we can. And if this process goes through the entire graph and yields an ordering where every edge has forward degree less than n, then we can just color greedily and we'll use the most n colors. And so we can assume that this argument gets stuck in some sense, which will yield this highly structured set W, which is either roughly a projective plane or the line graph is locally sparse. And so here by locally sparse, I mean that for every vertex, the neighborhood is missing, is missing a good chunk of edges. So the neighborhood of every vertex is not too close to a complete graph. And a probabilistic argument works well to color these locally sparse graphs. So in both of these two cases, we use the structure of the line graph to color H with the most n colors. And it's interesting that we use these graph theoretical arguments in both cases. Okay, so that's all I'd like to say about the proofs. So let me, let me wrap up. First to summarize, I pose this TEFL conjecture as the answer to Eridos's question that asks, if you have an in-vertex hypergraph of code degree T and maximum degree at most n, then the chromatic index is the most t times n. And combining our results from the two papers yields a proof of this conjecture for large enough n. So combined, we have this result that for sufficiently large n, every in-vertex hypergraph of maximum degree most n and co-degree most t has chromatic index at most t times n. And the case t equals one of this theorem confirms the error distributed loss conjecture for all the finitely many hypergraphs. And for t greater than equal to two, we actually prove some, something stronger. In particular, we characterize the extremal examples. We also prove the bounds hold for list coloring. And we prove that the theorem holds with a more relaxed degree assumption. Finally, we also prove the stability results that I mentioned earlier. And we prove this generalization of the De Bruyne errors theorem. So I'd like to conclude by sharing some open problems with you. The first problem I'd like to pose is the problem of characterizing the extremal examples for the error distributed lowest conjecture. So we've characterized the extremal examples for t greater than equal to two in the TEFL conjecture, but what about t equal one? And I described these three families of extremal examples, the projective planes, the degenerate planes, and the complete graphs. And these should essentially be all of the extremal examples, but with some minor modifications to them. So in particular, there's this notion of an overflow graph, which is a graph which has maximum degree delta and has n vertices, where the number of edges is at least delta times the floor of n over two. And it's fairly simple to show that these graphs have chromatic index at least delta plus one. One example of this is the complete graph here. Sorry, the complete graph minus an edge. This graph has nine edges. If you were to properly edge color this with at most four colors, then you would have a decomposition of its edges into matchings, and each matching has size at most two. So with only four matchings of size two, you can cover at most eight edges, but this one has nine. So you just wouldn't have enough, um, you just wouldn't be able to cover all the edges in this way. So an additional extremal example for the EFL conjecture are overflow graphs that have maximum degree and minus one. Another family of extremal examples are modifications to the degenerate plane. So I'm calling these odd blowups. If you replace the uh, pencil point in the degenerate plane with a clique, 
like here, that has odd size, then you will obtain a new extremal example. So I'd like to pose the problem, well, I'd like to conjecture that these are all the extremal examples for the Erdos fair willis conjecture. In particular, if you have an invert X linear hypergraph that has chromatic index N, then either your hypergraph contains one of these overfull graphs with max integrate N minus one as a subgraph, which in particular means that it has more than N minus one squared over two size two edges, and N is odd. Or two, it's a finite projective plane. Or three, it's one of these odd blow-ups of a degenerate plane. And our results on the TEFL conjecture actually make progress towards this conjecture by showing that the finite projective plane is the only extremal example that doesn't have maximum degree too close to n. Another question I like to ask is this conjecture of Birch, Freddy, and Manion. It states that every linear hypergraph has chromatic index at most this quantity. And you can think of this quantity as the maximum number of neighbors that a vertex has plus one. Hmm. So if true, this will be a, a generalization of both Vising's theorem and the Erdős and conjecture. So for graphs, the number of neighbors that a vertex has is the same as the degree of that vertex. But for hypergraphs, they're different. For example, this vertex has four neighbors. And so this quantity, which is the maximum number of neighbors a vertex has plus one, would be equal to five. Another way to think about it is it's the maximum degree of the shadow graph, where if you take your hypergraph and replace each hyper edge with a complete graph, it's the max degree of that plus one. Okay, so for this reason, this conjecture of true would imply Vising's theorem. And it would also imply the erdos trivia conjecture because this quantity in a linear hypergraph is always the most n. So I think that I think is a very beautiful conjecture. I think it'd be a really nice result. Good. I'd also like to ask whether Erdős Rolovas conjecture holds for list coloring, and this was conjectured by Faber in 2017. So does every invertex linear hypergraph have list chromatic index at most n? So I've talked about list coloring a bit in the talk, but I never defined it formally. So in this setting, what this conjecture means is that if you have a list of colors for every edge where every edge has at least n colors, hmm. then can you properly edge color the hypergraph in such a way that every edge is assigned a color from its list? So the case when all of the edges have the same list of colors corresponds to the Erdős Trivial Loss conjecture. Finally, I'd like to pose what's called the restricted Larmans conjecture, um, which is a, a special case of, of Larman's conjecture, which in turn was a special case of the, of the Borsak problem from geometry. And those have since been proven false, but yet this restricted version might be true. And it bears some resemblance to the erdős trivier conjecture. The conjecture states that if you have an invertex hypergraph that's intersecting, then you can decompose it into n families of hyper edges with the property that for each family, it has this kind of strong intersecting property that every pair of edges in the family intersects in at, least, um, in at least two vertices. Okay, so I'll stop there. Thank you all for listening. Thanks for your attention. Okay, thank you very much for Professor uh, Tom Kelly for a nice and, and interesting talk. And for our participants, I believe that you have a question to ask uh, Professor Kelly. But before that, uh, before we continue to discussion sessions, so uh, now we have uh, a brief intermission first. So Professor Adib uh, Baskoro, please. Okay. Yes, uh, for this uh, break, I would like to present you some uh, Indonesian songs, uh, Tom. You know, I okay. think uh, Indonesia is, uh, you know, Indonesia is a uh, 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 big country, uh, consists of uh, 17,000 islands and also uh, 1,300 uh, ethnic cities. And the population is around uh, 270 million. So that's quite a huge uh, country. 
And uh, for this afternoon, uh, we would like to uh, present you some Indonesian uh, song, folk song, only few ones. Uh, this is a medley songs, consists of four songs. The first song is called Angin Mamiri from uh, South uh, Sulawesi. And then uh, followed by Eris uh, from West Java uh, with different uh, language. Yeah? And then Buka Pintu from Maluku. And the last one is Chik uh, Chik Perio from West Kalimantan. So uh, enjoying the song, yeah? Can you see uh, our slides? Yeah? Okay. Oh, I should mention uh, one of the uh, singers, uh, mathematician, two, two of them, uh, our colleagues here, Hilda and Reno. Can you hear the song? Yeah? We can't hear the song. Maybe the volume could be louder. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Thank you.
Okay. Hopefully you're enjoying the songs. Yes, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. That was really lovely. Okay. Um, this is invitation for you to go to uh, Bandung, to Indonesia. Yes. I'm certainly grateful that I can give this talk to you guys um, from home, but I, it would be even better to be able to visit Indonesia. That would okay. be amazing. Great. Yeah. Okay. Now continue, Pa Suadi. Okay. Thank you, Professor Adi. So now we continue to discussion sessions. However, currently uh, there is no questions on uh, chat box. Maybe if you have a uh, for participant who want to ask uh, Professor uh, Kelly, uh, if you have a question, maybe you can ask directly. Maybe some questions. Okay, probably I, I just want to start from the questions. Okay, please, Professor Adi. Okay, yeah. So uh, thank thank you again. Uh, Tom, uh, for a wonderful and uh, inspiring talk. Uh, I just uh, realized that uh, uh, the conjectures of uh, Eros is always uh, uh, difficult, right? And you you able to solve one of them. So uh, that's a wonderful uh, effort. I just want to know how uh, how many years uh, did you put uh, your effort to get the with the groups yeah, to uh, pay these uh, conjectures, to, to solve this conjecture. And then uh, in the last talk, you give a lot of another open problems. So uh, because I'm, I'm having many, many students to, to work on graph theory, just, I just would like to know which one is the easier one <laughs> from, okay. from, from your problems, yeah, from the open problems. And the, the third one, I just uh, curious that is there any relation uh, between this uh, your results uh, with uh, Ramsey uh, theory? Because I'm I'm working on Ramsey. I just wonder is there any relation uh, between uh, the conjecture of Eddos, uh, father and uh, Lovas, yeah, with uh, Ramsey theory in uh, many uh, in in uh, any variant of Ramsey, yeah? Can be classical or uh, not classical one. Okay, mm -hmm. that's, that's all my question. Um, maybe I'll share my slides again so that I can reference them. Okay, so the first question was about how long, how many years we worked on the problem, is that right? Yeah. Um, actually, it, it was somewhat um, amazing that it didn't take us that long, um, we we put we published the or we posted the preprint on the archive in January, and we spent most of the fall of 2020 working on the problem. Mm -hmm. um, we we started out by trying to prove the small edge case, um, and we've fairly quickly were able to come up with this this proof that I mentioned that works with with one extra color mm. um and from there we were already we were already quite happy with that result um but we just kept pushing and um everything else just ended up working extremely well so we were very happy about that so mm. most it's most of the fall that's what we were working on in 2020. Mm. um the second question was about the open problems, right? Yeah. So I think these are very hard problems. Um, I think that the list version is probably more approachable. So already in the second paper that we have, as I mentioned, we proved that result for list coloring. And mm -hmm. that, that argument works for t equals one in the large edge case. So the difficulty here is to extend that to the small edge case. Mm -hmm. um, there. Are, I could offer a couple problems that are a bit more approachable than these. Mm -hmm. um, one problem. So first, let me let me point out that in this Birch Freddy manual conjecture, an asymptotic version of this result is known to hold. So in particular, for large values of say d, 
Hmm. If you have a linear hypergraph with this quantity is at most D, then the chromatic index will be at most D plus the O of D. So kind of an asymptotic version of this conjecture when this, when this quantity is large. So hmm. that's known to hold. Um, but that doesn't, but that argument doesn't work for list coloring. Um, so I'd be interested to see if that argument works for list coloring, an asymptotic mm -hmm. version of the conjecture of list coloring. And we mentioned this in the survey that I mentioned on the nibble method. And by the way, this, the survey on the nibble method um, has a lot more open problems. So that'd be a, a great place to look. Okay. And then another problem I can mention is, um, let me go back to this vertex coloring formulation. Another area of, Another question that Erdos asked is essentially what happens if um, instead of complete graphs, hmm. we consider graphs that have chromatic number at most n. Okay. And um, in a recent paper of mine with um, Daniela Kuhn and Derek Ossis, we show that in that case, you can get a bound on the union of two times n. Hmm. But that's a factor of two away from the best lower bounds. So the, the, the answer to that question could be anywhere between n and 2n. I think that's an interesting problem. Hmm. And so your third question was whether there are connections to Ramsey theory. Is that right? Ramsey, yeah. Ramsey theory. That's right. So uh, these edge coloring results aren't very closely related to Ramsey theory. However, the vertex, so this vertex coloring results that I mentioned, let's see. So here I mentioned this result about coloring hmm. vertices, uh, sorry, coloring graphs where they're locally sparse, meaning that the neighborhood is, mentioning, is missing some vertices. That's hmm. in some sense related to Ramsey theory. Hmm. In particular, graphs that are kind of the most locally sparse are triangle free graphs. If you have no triangle, that means that the neighborhood of every vertex has no edges. Hmm. And there's a well known theorem of Johansson from the 90s that provides a bound on triangle free graphs. And that's all that's very closely connected to um, Ramsey theory, in particular, yeah. what the value of the Ramsey number R3k is, the off diagonal Ramsey number. Yeah. And the the nibble method is, this probabilistic nibble method is certainly an important tool for studying this type of problem in Ramsey theory. Mm -hmm. Okay. Was, there, was that all the questions or was there another one? Sorry. Yes, then thank you very much for okay. the answer. Very, very nice, yeah. Okay, uh, maybe another questions from another participant. So maybe I will uh, ask you uh, a question. So here you talk about the graph with a small core degree. How about the core degree is maybe uh, large enough? Sorry, could you repeat the question? Uh, yes. Uh, yes, in this case, uh, you, you consider about the uh, hypergraph with, with, with small core degree. Mm -hmm. And what about uh, the core degree is large enough? maybe uh, more than two. So there's an interesting conjecture of Alan and Kim that asks, what is the largest chromatic index of say a K uniform hypergraph of max degree of most Delta uh, um, with, no, with no restriction on the co-degree? So, so for example, for three uniform hypergraphs, um, let me find one of these figures. For three uniform hypergraphs, what a, okay, well, so already for, for, let's just consider multigraphs. Um, multigraphs are the case k equals two. And if we have no restriction on the code degree, what's the maximum, what's the maximum possible value of the chromatic index of a multigraph of maximum degree delta? The answer is, turns out to be three delta over two. And this, this um, triangle with repeated edges 
is the extremal example. Because um, if you replace each edge in the triangle with delta over two edges, um, then you'll get maximum degree delta and you'll get three delta over two edges and it will be intersecting. Um, and so you'll need at least, you'll need to give every edge a distinct color to properly edge color it. So you'll use three delta over two colors. And so that's the, that's the, that's known for multigraphs. That's, that's known as Shannon's theorem. But for three uniform hypergraphs, the answer should be, I believe, seven delta over three. And that, but that's an open problem. And the extremal example there, so that's what, that's what Alan and Kim conjectured. And the extremal there, example there should just be the T-fold Fano plane. So if you replace each edge of the Fano plane with uh, delta over three copies of it, then the maximum degree is the most delta. And then and the number of edges will be seven delta over three. Um, so, and the, the on-kim conjecture is actually more general for that, but the special case where there's um, no restriction on the co-degree, I think is, is very interesting. Okay. Okay, thank you, Professor Kelly. And maybe another questions? Okay, there's still no questions on chat box. Maybe some of you can uh, ask a uh, question directly. No other questions? Professor Joko, maybe you have a question or maybe Professor Hilda? <laughs> for the next, uh, uh, for the next one, uh, probably from uh, from me, uh, Pa Swadi. Okay, so Professor just, Hildi, one, just one another question. So, which uh, those conjectures that you are going to uh, solve for the next time? <laughs> um, I'm not working on any of those problems at the moment. Um, there are still lots of them remaining, which is a testament to how prolific Erdos was. Um, are you considering uh, any other conjecture of uh, coloring, for example, like uh, magic uh, coloring on tree? Sorry, what kind of coloring? Magic, magic coloring. You, I'm not you, familiar with, with magic coloring. What is that? So, so well, uh, you color all the vertices and edges uh, by one up to the number of vertices and edges. Uh, show that uh, the sum about the weight of uh, every edge is uh, the same. The weight is okay. the weight is uh, the the sum of uh, label uh, of the edges together with uh, two uh, endpoints. So, so this, uh, I think that conjecture was by uh, Alex Rosa, Alex Rosa in 1962 or something. Yeah. Oh, wow. So it's still around uh, now. Yeah. Yeah. So this is also interesting. very interesting conjecture, but <laughs> yeah. So far, we we haven't known uh, the answer whether every tree is magic. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is this related to the um, the graceful labeling conjecture? Yeah, yeah, related, probably related to graceful uh, uh, labeling as well. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. I'm interested in. Um... One of the ways that I like to view edge coloring, as I mentioned in the talk, is, is a decomposition of your graph into matchings. And so I'm interested in, in decompositions into other structures. Okay. Uh, okay. 
like cycles, for example. Cycle. Oh, oh okay. Good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah, but Saudi. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Professor Adi. Maybe uh, for another participants. Do you have uh, questions? So if not, there's if there's no questions. So I think uh, uh, thank you for Professor Tom Colley for giving uh, a nice talk for this seminar. And before we uh, close the the event, so I will uh, give Professor Eddie to have. Maybe you have uh, some souvenir or maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So thanks again to Professor Tom Kelly for a wonderful and inspiring talk. And I would like on behalf of uh, ITB, uh, Faculty of Mathematics and Natural Sciences uh, Institute of Technology Bandung, uh, we would like to present you some certificate of this uh, uh, event and also some uh, souvenir uh is uh, actually uh is a uh, work of uh, uh drawing uh computer drawing uh, by my students so i'll i'll present you okay so this is the certificate for, yes, thank you. Uh, uh, for this uh, combinatory to the series. So thanks uh, again to your wonderful uh, lectures uh, today. Yeah. And also we present you some uh, drawing of your photo. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So thank I, you. Will, I really appreciate that. <laughs> I, will, I will send you this uh, to uh, document uh, to you by email. That's great. Thank, thank, thank you. you. And also asking uh, about the the nice slides that you have uh, today. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank right. you so much for um, inviting me to speak again, and thanks for letting me be a part of your your series. It's really great. Okay. So thanks, uh, Tom. So bye bye, and thank you to everybody. Yeah, for attending this uh, series. Yeah, today. So we are very uh, glad and very happy yeah, to, to have you uh, in this series yeah, today. So thanks again yeah, to Tom yeah, and also to everybody. Okay, okay. so bye-bye. and bye -bye. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> okay, bye-bye, Tom. Good, okay. good morning there, yeah? Still good morning. <laughs> okay, so... Uh,